Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated. Forever He is glorified. Forever He is lifted high. Human beings love to hate one another. And, and we're going to talk about racism. I've changed the title to Bigotry uh, in your Mark Moore's book, uh, Core 52. It's uh, God's Answer to Racism or Racism. And, and I've said I, I truly have a problem with the term. There is one human race. The, ver the verse this morning accentuates that. There is one human race. And every time we use the term racism, we imply there's multiple races. One of the best ways, one of the best psychological ways we can challenge it is to call it what it is. And that is bigotry and hatred. And here's the big clue about where we're going. Bigotry and hatred are not limited to skin color. Because one of the... Uh, one of the big things that we're seeing right now in our country is how divided our country is. And, uh, and it's divided over concepts, over ideas. And just like the day after man was thrown out of Eden, uh, we're really good at hating one another. Um, am I well versed with this? Yes, I grew up in the South. I am 62 years old. I grew up in the deep south. And I was taught, here's some of the things I was taught. I was taught uh, black men run better than white men because they've got an extra, le uh, an extra muscle on their leg. Um, I was taught all the words for talking about somebody of a different color, particularly for blacks. And it wasn't just Negro. It wasn't just African American. I mean, we used all the terms. And, and lest you fool yourselves that the church is exempt from such attitudes, let me tell you some of the worst lessons I got were in church. I actually had an elder friend at a church in Georgia. And here we are, we're in a town in Georgia, 60% black. 40% white. I was a minority for the first time in my life. 
and I, I was uh, listening to a discussion of the board of the church and the elders were arguing we need to keep them out of here. One elder said if we let them in, uh, they'll marry the white girls. And the other elder made a defense for keeping them out from the Old Testament. So I say that, saying it entered the church, because I would say there's bigotry and hatred in the church today, and it's not limited to skin color. So let's set the tone. That set the tone. Now that it's a real depressor, um, let's look at a couple of people in the Bible who might just change our attitude. Uh, and let me also preface this by saying the Bible is really good about sharing the nature of our heroes with us. And our heroes oftentimes have tarnished armor. So we're going to look at a Bible hero this morning who has very tarnished armor. But let's look at the verse this morning. The core 52 passage, Acts chapter 17, verse 26. From one man, he, God, made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in the history and boundaries of their lands. So what's the core passage about? God made us all. And he set the time and the limit. Some nations would rise up. Some nations would fall. He had a plan for all of us. God designed every one of us. Yeah. God designed every one of us. And that's many different colors, many different hues, many different traditions, many different ideas. But God also was smart enough to give us something to unify us, and his name is Jesus. So let's, uh, in order to understand this passage, we really need to look at a little bit of context here. So let's back up in Acts chapter 17, verse 16. And I will also tell you, uh, Paul is our really big hero in this story today. Uh, he does have some tarnished armor, but he manages to have polished it up quite well. We're going to be talking about somebody else with tarnished armor in just a few minutes. So Acts chapter 17, verse 16, and here's the background before we even get there. Israel had not known its own power since 586 B.C., actually since 722 B.C. when the northern kingdom was carried off. The Assyrians came in, they carried off the northern kingdom. Uh, later, you had Babylon and the southern kingdom. But then the Persians took over the southern kingdom. And then after the Persians came the Greeks. After the Greeks came the Romans. And so for hundreds of years, hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus, all they knew was oppression. But there was one group, one group in particular, that was strange as to how the Israelites responded to them. Strangely enough, they love the Greeks. To this day, the favorite name for a Jewish boy is still Alexander, for Alexander the Great. It was such a big issue. The, the Greek culture was so influence, influential. It was so powerful. They stopped speaking Hebrew. They had to translate the Bible during that time period into Greek because so many people lost the ability to understand the, the Bible in their own language. They adopted Greek ideas and Greek manners. They adopted Greek traditions. They loved the Greeks. And here's Paul who, as he uh, confessed in his letters, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees at one point. He was about as conservative as you can get. If you think of the most right-wing, most I mean, the, the people to the farthest right that you can think of today, that would have been the Pharisees. They were about as far right as you could possibly get. The farthest left was the Sadducees. They didn't believe much of anything of what they were doing. <clears throat> and the Pharisees in particular... Uh, were really good at hating other people. Any Jewish person was really good at hating other people, but the Pharisees in particular did not like 
Gentiles, and they did not like the Greeks because the Greeks had stolen their culture. So here's Paul, Pharisee of the Pharisees, Jewish man, he was a Roman citizen. There's all kinds of things about Paul that just boggle the mind. But here's Paul in Greece, in Athens of all places. And something, something that ought to steal your heart happened. I mean, this is one of the most beautiful moments in the New Testament, period. With all that background, here it is. Acts chapter 17, verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. It's right on the front lines. He's going to go right where the action is happening. He's in the marketplace even. Verse 18, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say?